welcome to the first of the Rejuvenate Grounded Dialogues. Um, this one is titled Rejuvenate Principles, Responses and Reflections. Um, Rejuvenate is an activity hub, a home and meeting place um, for people already working alongside and together with children and young people in ways that are intentionally and substantively participatory and for those who want support to do so. It started as a project to map literature, people and projects in the field. Um, and we've asked speakers today to connect to the work that grew out of this mapping process, our field principles or our working paper or the Living Archive, and to talk about their own experience. Um, we've got a lot of people here today. Um, we got quite overexcited about it because it's uh, first of many dialogues. Um, I've got Vicky with me, who will introduce herself shortly. Um, Jennifer Achendu, who is part of our team as well, who's the founder of Susti Vibes, um, an NGO in Lagos, Nigeria. Um, Professor Kay Tisdall, the Chair of Childhood Policy at the University of Edinburgh. Um, Okari Magati and Sarah Mbatia, who both work at Pende um, Kezo Letu in Nairobi, Kenya. Pierre McRae, who's the new Chief Executive Officer at the Consortium for Street Children. Um, Mark Canavera, who is the Co-Director at Care and Protection of Children um, at Columbia. Is that right, Mark? sort of I think other people can good talk enough, good enough. <laughs> good enough. Um, and we've also got um, Raisa Phillips and Koketso Longolo who are recently ex yay MA um, gender and development students um, from the Institute of Development Studies um, who are also interested in thinking about and working with children and young people um, and they're going to be facilitating some of our breakout rooms um, and I'm going to hand over to Vicky now. Yeah, I'm just, it's really nice doing a double act with Tessa here, actually, and actually sitting next to someone. It's fantastic. Um, so I'm the director of the Centre for Remote and Sustainable Communities up at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, but I'm on, also an honorary associate at IDS, where the uh, Rejuvenate is homed. So... I am so excited because having worked on these issues since the 90s, early 90s, I am just so excited to actually get this whole field re-energised and find so many people who are so passionate about child and youth centred work in communities. It's just absolutely fabulous. And I guess we're having a little bit of a focus on principles. You can think about our rejuvenate principles or your own. I'm going to just do a game and choose my three favorite today. And my three favorite today are relationships. So I think that is a relational agency of children and young people, but it's also our own. We can support each other. We can talk to each other and we can really progress this whole field. I'm going to choose justice, so that's personal, social, I think climate and generational. I think generational justice is really important, actually. And I think um, my last one, just for the moment today, is energy, because I think children and youth have energy, which sometimes we feel a little bit lacking of as we're getting a bit older and uh, very inspirational. I mean, my personal love is the Andoro Andoro, which is what I call a change scape, a landscape of change. Uh, and I like that in Rejuvenate because it really centers um, child and youth rights in people's realities. So in context, but it also acknowledges that children and young people <coughs> can really change their context and actually help to build different new alternative futures. So I'm really excited about seeing you all. It's fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I realize I'm supposed to be sharing. Um, Kay, I think, <laughs> I think you're up next. Um, just to, uh, the order of speakers is um, Kay, then Jen, then Pia, then Okari and Sarah, and then Mark. Um, I hope that's all okay. Okay, I will mute myself, hence. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. Um, didn't know I was going to go first, so that's great, because then I can concentrate on everybody else afterwards. 
And I was smiling when Vicky said that about energy. I completely agree with her, except that Vicky is so energetic. I've known her for years and that even your introduction was um, inspiring. So thank you. And certainly thank you for the invitation to be part of today. I found the working paper just such an informative and provocative overview. Um, and really interested through this dialogue and other things to, to see where the initiative is going to go next um, and really look forward to learning from you all today. Yep, so my name's Kay, Kay Tisdall. I work at the University of Edinburgh and I've come to just describe my um, area of work in childhood and new studies around children's human rights. And I have done work over the years, as Vicky says, 20 years or something like that, around children's participation and my latest reflection, I mean, of course, it's not the only important right for children, but it is one that it seems our adult systems and attitudes still find quite hard. So that's part of why um, I've been really interested in learning about that and working with others. And a slogan um, that we were using 20 years ago in a project that we uh, named from fashion accessory, part of the fabric around participation, we coined a slogan about how to make participation meaningful, effective, and sustainable. And um, I think that was even echoed in the paper, still uh, perhaps an agenda for all of us today. And then just before I say, um, you know, start going into things, I just wanted to recognize that anything I say wrong today, of course, is my fault. <laughs> but to respect, um, even I see people on the call who I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with over the years, um, and certainly um, want to yeah, recognized all that children and young people um, have taught me and being part of those partnerships over the years um, in terms of reflecting on this today. But hey, um, we were asked to bounce off our own work and then to look at Rejuvenate and its principles. So I thought just to start with a recent example that has made me think a lot. Um, and it's in a project that we have now completed, Improving Justice in Child Contact. And with that, uh, we supported a young expert group of survivors of domestic abuse. They called themselves Yellow. You're supposed to go like this, Yellow. Um, and they were facilitated by Scottish Women's Aid. And the formation of this group happened to be quite timely because we were going through family law reform in Scotland. And the group had very strong views on this, in part because Scottish Women's Aid had been working um, with these young people as well as others um, on these issues. And Yellow was very firm that they wanted these views to be part of the decision making on this law reform in the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. This included the very memorable time that they dressed up as ghosts to go and meet the minister who was responsible. It was on Halloween, so that's appropriate that way, but also they chose to do so because that's how they felt they were in family law decision making, although it was supposedly about them that they were treated um, as ghosts. Now, particularly because, um, well, this is what we think, because they were young survivors of domestic abuse, and certainly in Scotland, family law is quite contentious. It actually took a huge amount of work for the young people's views to be considered in the decision-making. I actually realized I gave evidence on them giving evidence uh, to the Scottish Parliament and the committees. So it required a lot of work sort of to get them in, so to speak. But as we know can happen, once they were forming relationships with the committee uh, members, um, the committee members really took that on. And in fact, the young people were extremely influential and in making very dramatic changes uh, to the family law, which is now being implemented. So we thought it's the kind of an example that really got me thinking, just to make a few um, points in relation to Rejuvenate's paper. First of all, it made me think about how we frame participation so in policy studies, you may know that there's a sort of old adage that, you know, how you frame the problem will, uh, will then lead to how you frame the solution. So it makes me think, and as the paper encourages us to think, because how useful is participation as a term? On the one hand, I use it a lot because of the UNCRC. I mean, Article 12.1 is quite famous. Uh, perhaps you can say it in your paper. Um, but I also find it useful that although it is a general principle, of course, all the rights in the UNCRC apply as well as others, but really important participation rights, like I think the right to receive and give information, perhaps we don't give enough importance to in participation. I do appreciate the UNCRC, um, although you may have gathered my accent is Canadian. 
Um, but my home policy area is Scotland um, and I'm very strict in Scotland. The rule of law matters a lot, right? So to have an international law and a convention and in setting international standards is actually quite influential. Um, and I often think of it as um, when you get them in law, things are sticky. <laughs> you can't just quickly change things and like you could with a policy, but there's advantages of legislation that's sticky. But is Article 12 enough? I mean, it is quite a limited right, I would suggest. And if you look at the definition that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child gives to participation in terms of Article 12, it's interesting. I mean, I quite like their definition, but it does say it's, um, about children and adults being in dialogue. And that makes me think, well, are there times actually that, you know, children are active in themselves? Could, do we need to go beyond that in terms of how we think about participation um, and the agenda we might all have together? So Rejuvenate puts in, I think, two concepts, agency and empowerment, and we may come back to that. I think there's also mention of um, protagonism. I think Irene's on the call. She's taught me a lot over the years about what that might mean, and we might come back to that. Um, Patricio, who's also on the call, and I've been really interested by, if we look at things in terms of the lens of children's activism, which is arguably about them grabbing the agenda that's important to them, um, and them um, acting to make quite transformative change. You think about it as activism, how does that change our lens? So really interested about like youth activism, like we just, the literature just wants youth to be active um, versus uh, we were designing one uh, research proposal at one point and people from a country I won't name said we just actually can't use that term. You know, it just would be politically problematic if we said they were child activists. So interested about how that framing would change things. So I am arguing that the framing is quite important and the renaming, but just a little bit of caveat is we have had quite a lot of change of terminology in our field, right? And I think often that happens when there's underlying challenges that we haven't probably quite addressed. Um, and I bet we could in five minutes create a list of challenges that are remarkably common across our different fields of work. So I, I think it's not just about renaming and reframing. It's also looking at those challenges that have remained a little bit stubborn, I would say, since the UNCRC ratification. Which brings me to my second point is, I really liked about the paper and what's doing is, um, I think we've gotten so used to the familiar challenges that it's sort of time to learn from what works. And I think the paper and this whole thing is about, I mean, I presume nothing is perfect, but just what can we learn from examples? And, and that's what I like about yellow. Again, it wasn't necessarily perfect, or whatever, in terms of where it ultimately got to. But I think there was a lot to, to learn from those examples. Um, what really makes things um, meaningful, effective, um, and perhaps even sustainable. And I agree with Vicky about the importance of relationships. Um, I think yellow, it really made the difference because the politicians felt responsible basically to yellow um, once they um, were able to give their views. And really intrigued by this term accountability and how that could be useful. Um, you know, we're very excited in Scotland. We're getting UNCRC incorporation. Um, so it's really gonna be brought into our domestic law. So we're really interested in thinking about accountability and what, what, what could it mean? How could we have a really virtuous circle of monitoring, evaluation, change, et cetera, um, to, to really think about that and how do we build that into children and young people's participation? I think also going on about what spheres are we perhaps not touching? So in the areas I work, I just realized that we really concentrate a lot on public bodies, you know, government um, and all the services that result. But um, Tara Collins brought me into a project that was looking at children's participation in business. I found it quite scary, right? It's like think of all the ethics. But on the other hand, it's such an important area for children and young people's lives. So I felt that we needed to try to see how we could engage with it ethically. Another area that actually kind of worries me quite a bit is sports, um, you know, in terms of, uh, it, you know, it's often a well, you think about the coaching and all that kind of stuff. I think it's an underexplored area. Again, very important to many children and young people, um, but how we do that. But I guess what I, where I'm going is just, are there different spheres that would benefit from us looking into? And how do we challenge ourselves in terms of, ch of which children and young people are being included and which are being excluded? 
So if I hear once again about children being unrepresentative, I may get um, unpopular, I may say my, my response, because it seems to me it's fantastic. All children and young people have the right to participate. It's about how we include all rather than excluding some. Or what about Yellow's example? The real barrier we had to get over were adults' fears of re-traumatizing the children. And that was very real, but that's not, that's a reason to do it well or to try to figure out how to do it, not to prevent it. So. I think there's still challenges in terms of which children and young people are allowed to participate. So to end, my bottom line is, how do we make children's participation absolutely mainstream? Projects, yes, but like, let's not have it always be a project. How can we, can we just make it part of everything that we do? And I have to say, it took me a little while. You may have got there much earlier than me, but I had a light bulb moment. Actually, it was around yellow and family law reform. And as we were arguing for things and just the UNCRC, which I do like, but it's minimum standards. We can go beyond it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kay. That was really great. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna move swiftly on. And um, Jennifer, you're up next. Thank you very much, Tessa. And um, hi, everyone. It's so good to be here. And it was so good to hear from Kay with all of the experience and insight she brought on, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Rejuvenate paper. My name is Jennifer Uchindu. I am currently. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? We didn't oh, awesome. do anything. Oh. Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so I was just I was just saying that my organization is called Susty Vibes, and um, from the name you can sort of already tell the vibes in sustainability because what it really means is sustainability vibes. And putting that side by side with everything Rejuvenate stands for, um, the very first principle I was able to completely tie into was energy. So I started my organization as a young person being very passionate about youth work and climate activism in Nigeria, um, side by side with environmental issues. But there was that energy missing in the fact that young people were sort of told what to do, how to be activists, you know, what to say, the kind of um, emotional um, speeches they needed to make to get our government to act. Whereas it needed sort of like a rejuvenation, as it were, where young people were saying, this is what we want, this is how we feel. And that was what we were able to bring with Susty Vibes, you know, even from our naming and, you know, what we called ourselves, that we're passionate young people that wanted to change the way youth work around climate activism was done in Nigeria. And so the bit about energy is really important because in, you know, some conservative society, it can be misconstrued you know as young people being rude or being too ambitious or, or asking for too much but really i guess that's really the crux of what we mean by youth participation if you want young people and children to participate you have to be willing to you know explore all of their creative ideas allow them you know do activism or social work the way they deem fit and be open for experimentation and you know moving from energy one other um, principle that really stuck with me was relationships now in the past one year i have sort of focused my work not just on climate activism with young people but looking at the idea of eco anxiety um, so that's a new sort of buzzword and term a lot of people are now talking about looking at the intersect between mental health issues and climate change and the climate crisis and how that is affecting young people. Now you put that side by side with everything we, we spoke about at the Rejuvenate paper, you realize that there is no way we can sort of safeguard the idea of eco-anxiety and overwhelm that young people are feeling now without relationships. We need that set of space, the safe spaces, the community to put out our feelings. Now this goes beyond you know, what um, we have in academic papers. These are real feelings of you know, young people saying they're not able to, they feel very powerless in the face of the climate crisis. And that's where sort of relationships come to play. Um, a third bit would be around intergenerational support. 
I've always had a question mark with what does it really mean, you know, in practice, and then putting that in my work. Does it mean that an adult or an older person has to tell me, you know, what to do or how to do it? Or are they going to be willing to listen? And that's why the three pillars of Rejuvenate now sort of come to play, where you have space, where you have system change and support. Those three sort of have to go hand in hand. There has to be space where young people share their experiences, they're able to share their um, conversations, their feelings, their fears, their ideas. And then there is a system that is willing to change, evolve, you know, evolve with their cap capabilities, but also evolve with their thinking. With cli the climate crisis, now we're seeing that um, before now, the conversation had just been, we need to cut down emissions. It's about you know climate change and the environment. But now we're seeing that it's a social justice issue. You cannot talk about racism. You know we, we can't talk about the climate crisis without infusing the racism bit of it. And young people are seeing it and demanding that those conversations now happen. These are some examples where you then put the practicality of you know what we spoke about in the rejuvenate paper, where these are real issues of participation, where the three come to play and you can't put one from the other and before I started Susty Vibes I knew nothing about you know terms like participation you know I knew I just wanted young people to come together in Nigeria and for us to actually make change the way we see change um, a final very final uh, bit about the principle is the idea of um, the creative and visual practices very interestingly, I started my organization, Susty Vibes, through a blog. You know, it was just a WordPress blog, and it was me putting in my views and opinion about how a young, you know, Nigerian was seeing the idea of sustainability. And that got a lot of following, lots of young people saying, okay, if this person is bold enough to speak about this, then maybe we should form a community. So it's really, really interesting and I would say inspiring when we let young people actually come up with creative ways to um, be involved in social change. And we've seen a lot of that, you know, come up from um, the Living Archive, several examples of what happens when you actually truly make space. You know, um, one thing Rejuvenate taught me was making that difference between what it means to be youth led and what it means to be youth focused. Oftentimes, youth focus had been the issue. It had been, you know, business as usual. Put a lot, a, a bunch of young people together, have them attend a conference, tell them what to say. Whereas nobody's asking, what are you thinking? How do you feel about this? And how does this drive your agenda and your future? And, you know, for me thinking about, you know, Africa, the agenda 2063, and how we want an Africa that is fit for children and young people, it starts with making space, making space that, you know, comes side by side with support and system change. I believe that, you know, we've started something really, really interesting with Rejuvenate, and it's really asking the hard question, can we rethink children and youth participation? Can we allow that thought process evolve and be open, open to create space for dialogue where we can challenge each other and not just say, this is how it's meant to be. So all of the, you know, the convention, the rights, all of those things are great, but on the field back home in Nigeria, you know, in the Niger Delta, no one is thinking about that. Young people are thinking about their future. You know, there's the emotional side of it. And that's why, you know, all of the rejuvenate principles then come to play. Because in real life, it's about the simple words, the relationship, justice, the energy. All of those things come to play and make youth participation truly meaningful. And I, I look forward to, you know, having the um, breakout rooms where sort of we can explain and talk more and listen more on, on what we really mean by um, youth participation. Of course, for me, this is my everyday life running an NGO in Nigeria, working with young people and seeing how we're able to evolve in the things we can do. You know, now I can obviously do more than writing a blog. There's so much I've learned over the course of the work. But if I wasn't given the space and support, 
possibly, you know, Susti Vibes wouldn't have grown to where it is. So this is sort of the crux of the matter and making um, the practicality, having this project an example where people like me can share examples. And I'm looking forward to, you know, my other panelists sharing their own examples of real life situation of what it means to have children and young people participating in social change. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, Pia. Great. Um, lovely to be with you all. And um, and uh, yeah, a little bit humbling. I'm not a child. I uh, haven't got the sort of length of working in this space that many folks on the panel do. I wanted to just riff off two of the rejuvenate field principles, the evolving capacities one, so supporting children and young people contributing ideas and expressing opinions and the empowerment one. So very much some familiar themes to what Jennifer and Kay have picked up. And I wanted to talk about them in the context of how we uh, at the Consortium for Street Children sort of seek to back for very much participation of street connected children, particularly our advocacy work and international advocacy work. And I wanted to start with some of my experiences prior to doing this job in previous roles um, with some of what Kay talked about, the familiar challenges uh, of, of this, uh, which led me to being a little bit you know, about the point of, this was, I've spent 14 years of my, um, uh, the last five years were from 2011 to 16, and it's complicated trying to support child participation in a country where there are some very real risks and limits and what that means in practice. Um, but, but other familiar challenges, the challenge of the sort of, um, you know, tokenistic patronizing uh, potential of doing this. You know, I remember going to an international conference and everyone was, oh, great, we've got these uh, young people up on, on, on stage speaking about something nobody talked about the content of what they were saying it was the symbolism of them being there and I get you know I'm sure you've had similar experiences to that and then for me a sort of searing worst event was um was doing an event again this was in China um where we were working around inclusive education and we had a child uh involved in that advocacy event as well as some Chinese uh, uh, super singer superstars um, uh, and she had cerebral palsy and at one point in the event she was overcome with emotion and burst into uh, well-meaning is a come external affairs member of journalists coming with you know massive cameras with huge lenses flocked around the girl was crying on my shoulder they flocked around me and when I said afterwards you know what why weren't you putting those journalists off it was like but that would make a great story that would help our advocacy totally losing sight of it so you know again you know to case theme about um, adult fears of re-traumatizing we don't want to we encouraging a child to grow and express themselves isn't risk free and we, we we shouldn't get over worried about it but, but sometimes you know just making people think about some of the basics that we can do to safeguard and to make it a more protected experience i'm sure those are things you will have all thought about many times um and i also wanted to share for me one of the first i, I don't know why this particular experience has just ingrained itself on my memory but one of the most powerful experiences I had uh, of seeing it just sing involving uh, children um, in advocacy and it was a brilliant afternoon it was again working in China I was in the west of China in Sichuan in a very mountainous rural very um, far away part of the country far from Beijing um, and uh, I was watching some teenagers who were involved not just in their school but in the local community in putting in place disaster risk reduction preparations and there was something about the combination of their confidence in a country where children aren't often given confidence to take leadership and have a voice their confidence in themselves the seriousness with which they were taking this role and the seriousness with the seriousness with which they were listened to that was just so inspiring it wasn't it wasn't one of those things that you know it was very it was a quite small bit of activity in their community it wasn't a very particularly sexy subject in some ways but it was such a powerful afternoon 
Um, and I think, you know, that sort of stayed with me of how do we how do we kind of replicate that in different ways at different levels if you're trying to do advocacy? So the consortium, we really try to in involve street connected, street connected children in our advocacy work in a meaningful way. Um, and that sort of involves three, three parts of the process, if you like, uh, both involving children in the planning stage, um, in the implementation, so developing materials or potentially um, uh, organizing direct engagement between street connected children and duty bearers. And then monitoring and evaluation, trying to involve um, children who are connected with the streets in terms of measuring uh, the impact of what we've done, particularly in their lives. Um, uh, and we think about three options for involving children, the sort of classic consultative approach and so the work we did for the general comment um, 21 on the UNCRC, uh, giving guidance to governments on responding to children in street situations. You know, we did consultations in, in uh, 28 languages, 49 countries. We really tried to bring children's voices into that. And I think it made it a more powerful document. Um, and, uh, and, you know, something, again, many of you will have seen. The second is more around um, a collaborative approach. So allowing children to engage in the design and development of programs. We're doing a piece of work with another piece of work with IDS. Uh, so around trying to respond to children being in the worst forms of child labor, uh, doing specifically work in Nepal and Bangladesh, and really in a meaningful way, trying to involve children in the design of the project. So not just giving their stories, not just collecting the stories of other children, but then analyzing it and really building that program around it. And then thirdly, you know, where you can really fully do, and again, kind of bouncing off what Jennifer and Kay have talked about, where you can really have child-led participation, where children are, you know, really leading the effort from start to finish. I think that can be extremely hard in some of the international work. So we see that much more where, where, with our network members who are doing sub-national um, and national advocacy. Um, right at the moment, we're working with two children in our net, from members of our network who are sharing their views on the question of alternative care with the Committee on the Rights of the Child this month. And I know we've had lots of these dilemmas about how do we do this in ways that we think work, question of representation, the question of trying to not make it tokenistic, but we still think it's really important to do that not least because it helps reframe how the children see themselves, how they see their peers, um, and then of course, how decision makers and influencers um, view them. I don't think participation should be an advocacy, a tool in an advocacy armory, but rather um, in many ways, it should be um, underscoring why we're doing the advocacy in the first place, and particularly for children who, who are in street situations whose voices are, aren't heard enough. And, um, and it, is, it is certainly our job in our organization to, to amplify their voices. So thanks, and really looking forward to uh, everyone else's contributions. Thanks so much, Pia. Thank you. Corey and Sarah, I'm not sure how you're going to do this. Um, welcome everyone, so I'm going to start. By giving a backdrop of before, I mean, I'm going to start by giving a background of this conversation by saying that in 2015, we did a research with Vicky, hi Vicky, um, that was funded by UNGE. It was a, a research on our street connected children, right? So, on this particular conversation, we are doing a follow up. From that initial research, we did 48 case studies, very detailed. The research has gone on to be published. Uh, and it's, it's available in the public space. On this particular assignment, we're doing a revisit where we are looking at uh, revisiting street connected girls, the ones that we'd worked with back in 2015. So out of the 48, we are working with 12 to, to identify how they've been able to cope in terms of uh, safety, in terms of the support systems that have been accessible to them, and how the systems have been able to change, also the balance how, as their vulnerability scale changed over the years, especially over the last six years. Um, all right, so the aim, so the aim of the research was to generate new knowledge. We're just looking to generate new knowledge about young people 
in their street situations, how they've balanced their vulnerability, and how they've interacted with the support systems in country, right? Are the spaces now more open for them to express themselves? Are they being heard? And also to know how they have coped or how they have responded or how they had adapted, especially in the space of the COVID pandemic. In the methodology, we had to redo or we had to, re, to do the context reanalysis on a scale on looking over the last six years, all right? We had to identify through the social researchers that we are working with, the 12 case studies or the 12 uh, young girls. So in tracking, we managed to get 11 uh, girls and one boy to work with in the research. And also in the initial research, we had had 10 young researchers were involved. We were able to track two. One is with me today, it's called Sarah and myself. So to reevaluate what we learned in that particular research. Initially, we had also developed a comprehensive uh, co uh, context ethical framework. How do we work with children? How do we access, um, how do we develop contextualized, easy to understand consent forms, right? How do we create spaces that are safe and to a large extent that are identified by the young people or where they feel comfortable to work from, right? Not come to our hotel or come to our office, but what areas in your community are most accessible where you feel safe, where we can work from, right? Child participation, like everyone knows, is a lot of work. It's easier to say, welcome to the meeting, uh, sit at the back. Children should be sitting at the back. But participation is about asking them, come, let us co-create the solutions that we need to, to create. And how we've done that in this particular research is that uh, just aligning it back now to rejuvenate around the relationships, we were able to identify 11, the, the, we were able to identify 12 young research, I mean, young participants were involved from the previous research for six years and we were able to work with them, building, uh, and ensuring that they have been, over those years, they've been supported with vocational skills, they've been supported with psychosocial support for ease in tracking. So that whoever is running projects, where, wherever you're running your project from, you don't work with children in a silo. You do a project for one year and then you close out and disappear. You always have to figure out how are the interrelationships working. If you can't work with, a, if you can't work with an individual child, what other relationships had you created in the communities where you work? Are you working with area chiefs, for example? Are you working with whatever authorities are there? Because there's always an inflow of children coming in and going out. So it was easier for us to access those cases. The other thing is uh, around evolving capacities is to identify that we had worked with young researchers, 10 of them. Some of them are grown in their careers and they moved on to other parts, but we were able to identify two who are still in the academia space, who are still in the research space, and we're able to work with them six years on to identify, because they already understood uh, the research protocols and the methodologies. Around justice, the organization itself, and the Kazoletu, is centered around the child rights approach. We provide access to justice for children in conflict and contact, and that we are centered around actualizing or implementing the principles of child rights. I want to pass the conversation to Sarah to talk about our findings, especially looking into the COVID itself. Because before COVID, children and youth, despite the economic challenges, they were thriving. They were in school. They were doing either vocational skills program, they were working in the informal sector. They had safe spaces to, to play. Their relationships were strong. And then COVID happened, and then with the lockdowns. So I'm going to leave uh, that part for Sarah to, to talk about on the research findings. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah. I'm the one you talked about. 
I was a young researcher then, not so young now. And uh, as we worked with the participants, some of the things that came out, especially with COVID, was the surge in early pregnancies that we saw in around 54% of the young participants who are, they were young girls, now they were they are young women, if you consider them. And we found that 54% of them were either pregnant or they, they had infants, what, what we would refer to as infant babies. This brought in more challenges considering that they are street connected and they're de depending on support systems. In fact, one of them commented that when asked, is anything, did anything good happen during as COVID is going on? The participants say that my, my, teenage, uh, my teenage sister got pregnant. So that kind of captures the surge in pregnancies. And then as the major support systems broke down and they shut down because as COVID restrictions were put in place, so organizations were forced to close, either shut down a hold of their, what they were giving to the street connected girls. These table systems were disrupted and this exposed the children and the youth who are especially like the teenage mothers who are already at a vulnerability, sorry, vulnerability. They're exposed to the, uh, they were more exposed. And however, we noticed that one of the traditional systems seemed to hold and these were the grandmothers. And this, the grandmothers were providing things like, we could say the, the psychosocial support, things like finances. And also they were giving roofs for the street connected girls. And this support, you can see it was even mentioned by one particular participant said as soon as the schools were closed and they were forced to lock down and everything. The first thing before, as soon as they had the lockdown was happening, they were sent over to their grandparents. So this shows that grandmothers, in a way, they seem to understand teen speak more than their parents and other guardians. So it's important to focus also on this, which kind of touches on the rejuve rejuvenate principle of relationship. Then another thing that we saw was like 58% of the participants who are working in the informal sectors, as Okari said. And as the close down happened, they were forced to even look for more jobs, either as their caregivers were, they lost their jobs or the street connected children were forced to now supplement the income as the income became lower for their caregivers. And so they had to pitch in. Another thing we noticed was with the COVID restrictions, already in the, if you look in the slum setting, it's crowded. So it presents the opportunity for them to have family conflict. Now imagine with the close down and the restrictions, they're not going to work, the curfews are imposed, you can't go very far. So this, forced people to live in crowded situation, putting it at a risk of having more conflict. So I just look, we just covered a brief look of the research outcomes, considering the time we have, and I'll pass it on to Okari to add some more. Thank you, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> Thanks so much, both of you. Thank you. I'm very struck by the recurrence of relationships in all of the presentations. Um, Mark, over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Sarah, for really showing us how, um, you know, research can just make very real um, children's situations when we say, oh, we don't know, we don't have data. Children have all the data that we need about their lives. Um, my name is Mark Canavera. Forgive me if I start coughing. I've had a terrible cough for a week now. Um, mute me if you need to. I do want to thank um, Vicky, Tessa, Tessa, and Mariah. I, I really think the Living Archive just makes the practice of child participation very tangible, very real, and um, demystifies it in a way. 
Um, if any of you know the child protection worker and, and scholar Stephanie Delaney, Delaney, she always just says, just do it. And I think we heard a little bit of that in Pia. Yes, take the precautions, but don't get over worried about it. And child participation, you know, isn't magic or a potion or something that even needs, in many cases, specialized skills. We interact with children all the time in our lives um, and encounter them every day and learning how to do that better, I think is at the core. And I think that's why so many people have highlighted the, the relational um, principle that is in Rejuvenate. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into depth on the visual and pre I, just for those who are listening, we were asked to kind of speak on <coughs> two or three of the principles that <coughs> spoke to us. <coughs> There it is. So sorry. Um, I and um, I won't go into depth, but this piece around um, the visual and creative practice, praxis. Um, you know, children create art and tell stories and draw absolutely everywhere, all the time. And I don't think we've gotten very good at listening to what children are communicating through that at all. And I think we're really missing a lot of what children are trying to say. And I just hope that as, as our work evolves, that we as adults get much better at connecting to and hearing what children are trying to tell us through, through the visual arts. I'm gonna cheat a little bit and talk a little bit about two of the principles together, transformation and energy, which we've both heard about. And I love these two and I love them together because what you're pointing out is that this work isn't about checklists or manuals. There are so many child participation guides and checklists that make it seem very formulaic, but actually in that interactional process, there's a lot of um, human magic that happens. And there are a lot of social movements led by children, as we've already heard about from Jennifer and others. And finding them and supporting them is really important. You know, Kay mentioned that there's sensitivity around activism. And something that we at the CPC where I, where I work, we're embracing is that our work is inherently political. And we may need to get more confident and stronger in embracing our role as activists um, because children are demanding that. And I think that's also connected to the, the principle of justice. Children have very, very just ideas about the environment, as we heard from Jennifer, um, armed conflict, as we've heard from a few people. <laughs> Um, things that we don't think about much like animals, like children have a very interesting connection to animals, or as we've heard from Okari and Sarah and Pia, people's rights to housing and to a family and to decent living conditions. Children have absolutely clear, just activist positions on these, <laughs> and we should acknowledge that and embrace it um, and, and think about how we can support that better. And part of that support may involve being ready to listen to anger. I will never forget the moment. I was so excited that Greta Thunberg was going to speak at the UN. I thought it was going to be her usual passion itself. But for her to stand in front of the UN and say, and what I think of as really one of the great speeches of the past 20 years, how dare you? The anger was so palpable. And she was right. What street child wouldn't be angry about their roots or about their, um, their situations? Um, I'm gonna end by talking a little bit about another principle some people have mentioned, which is evolving capacities. And I've just been thinking a lot lately about adultism and where do I think this comes from? Our prejudice to believe adults or to think they're smarter or more capable of decision-making. And something I've been thinking about recently is that each of us as an adult has had a childhood. And so we think we understand it, but our own perception is really our understanding of childhood 
after we think we have completed, achieved, or surpassed, and learn the lessons from it. And I think of the statement, youth is wasted on the young. I mean, what a terrible expression of adultism. Um, young people kind of making mistakes is a really beautiful part of life. And evolving capacities are also accompanied by our evolving socialization about what we think is proper in the world. I found a journal entry of my own from when I was a 17 year old high school student. And I wrote a note to my future self that was so hilarious and wonderful. I said to myself, when you read this as an adult, do not discount the melodrama of the feelings that you're reading now, just because I'm young as I write this. And I thought, yeah, that's absolutely true. I kind of could see that I might be socialized into thinking that what I was doing was melodramatic, but it, the feelings were real and the emotions were real. And what we really have to do is learn to undo that and to and learn to undo the socialization, learn to undo the adultism. And I think the easiest way is by speaking to children who are children today and now. And I think we've heard some really nice examples of that. And there are, of course, many in the Living Archive. And I don't want to suggest that children are more innocent, because I think that's a very laden and, and misapplied term. But they have not been socialized into certain ways of thinking and can often think more creatively, and I think justly, about the problems in the world today. Those are my thoughts. Thank you all. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks for doing it with a cough and a sore throat as well. I appreciate that a lot. Um, I, I really like the idea of unlearning um, that resonates across all the speakers, the idea of adults finding it very hard to adequately engage with children and and yeah the idea of evolving socialization i'm i'm not gonna talk i think we should go into um breakout rooms uh we're going to go into five breakout rooms facilitated by jen cookie ricer sarah and okari and then we'll come back together and i hope people get a chance to talk a little bit more um in the smaller spaces thank you so much i'm gonna um ask the facilitators of um each of the breakout rooms to just give a brief report back and then um, I'm going to um, talk briefly about the Living Archive and how people contribute to it and connect to it. Um, Raisa, do you want to start? Hi, okay, so I'm going to try and uh, give you a brief thing, but we had uh, Kay, Anna, Pranuti, Parul and Moy in our group and we, uh, we quickly talked about some of the things that you know, we were, like Kay was saying in her uh, presentation, that we're afraid to touch when it comes to children, for example, sexuality, and Parul was sharing about how uh, that was the core of her research work, and um, how they were effectively able to do participatory methods and bring, bring conversations about sexuality uh, with, um, with children. Uh, we then went on to uh, a very interesting and controversial conversation about evolving capacities as one of the principles, whether uh, evolving capacities as a principle should be there when we're talking about child rights because uh, adults evolve, everyone evolves. Why, why is it so centered around children? Um, and why, why are we limiting children to this concept of evolving capacities? And when we look at that as a principle, does it actually limit children? Because especially when you look at law and legality, then you are looking at children and deciding things like they don't have the capacity to do things. Um, so should we be, should capacity be even a thing that we, sh we are considering? And everyone had really meaningful inputs to give. Uh, about that, uh, we went on to talk about grant making and ensuring child participation within that, and also establishing accountability measures which involves child participation within grant making and to ensure impact. So um, those were kind of the things that we talked about. If anyone else in the group wants to quickly jump in about something I've missed out, that would be great. But otherwise, that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Raisa. Anyone else want to jump in? 
uh, Sarah. Okay, thank you. We we talked about evolving capabilities of the children and how children are being involved in working with their adults working as to support them and how it's important to, to not to discriminate, to discriminate uh, from the children because their adults usually feel threatened because young people are coming with all this energy in them and they want to contribute. And adults, even the politicians are feeling threatened and usually politicians don't feel threatened. So we were looking at how it's important for the evolving capacity and the, using the energy for the children to help them to make decisions. We even had a young, young participant in the background. So we also let them we could hear them in the background. So it's important also to involve children because they have what they want to contribute. And they also bring us, open our eyes to what is around us instead of just focusing on just going. So it's good to guide them and to hear what they have to say. Anybody from the group, please contribute where I have missed out. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. Let me just let me just add that uh, Thanks, it Mary. was a very brief conversation, but we uh, shared some points about how our work um, resonates with uh, the project Rejuvenate and um, looking forward to get to know more about it. There is a lot um, to um, share between us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. I've heard a lot about you, so it's very nice to see you here. Um, Akari, do you want to report back? Our conversation centered around participation, but mostly about building power, right? The power for children to influence, to support, and to build in, in that sequence. One of the key things that uh, came out from the participants, we had uh, Jessica and Karin and Sanya, is um, justice. So we talk about justice, but justice for what? Right? What is the justice for? We talk about participation, we talk about inclusion, and then we talk about justice. What is the justice for? So justice should be centered around the needs of the children. And then we kind of went back to, there's a discordance between um, child, particip child youth participation and youth activism, and why those two bring such a huge challenge uh, to governments around dialogue. You are allowed to have a child youth participation uh, dialogues in wherever you work in the villages and stuff, but the point where you say you have a youth activism uh, event, then it becomes a problem. So where is the discordance? And what do we do so that we merge uh, the two? Because the silo is, part, uh, is around, one is for external politics, where I talk about activism, then there's the politics that tied it tied to it. But it was felt by Jessica that the two should be merged, or we should find a consensus on how to work so that we're able to reach. Uh, anything else? I think that's, that's what we covered mostly. Thanks so much, Sorry. Koki? Hi, um, in my group, we had Rachel, we had Lifate, we had Mark, Ricky, and Tessa. And there were just two main themes that um, came up. It was the importance of relationships as a principle from Rejuvenate. Um, and Rachel talked about longevity and having those relationships, maintaining them, and making sure that they're sustainable. Um, but also the important... Um, this is a, a word that I'm going to keep forever. I don't know why I haven't been using it. We need to be more aware of adultism. And um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have youth-led um, uh, work specifically, as Vicky mentioned. It's more about youth who want to be included. They want to be yeah. part of the process without necessarily always having to lead that work. Um, and we, we spoke about adultism and how it involves just having a willingness to unlearn. 
everything that we've learned as adults, um, but also being willing to make mistakes and to learn and grow from them collectively with the young people. Um, there's also another term that uh, Vicky mentioned that she learned during her field work, and that is editing social norm, norms. So it's, it's about a slow resistance, really, but just being willing, again, to just edit out things that you've learned that aren't really helping you in the work that you're doing. Um, yes, and I think that's basically pretty much everything we spoke about, but if I have left anything else, do let us know. Oh, sorry, that didn't work, yeah. unmute. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Jen, over to you, um, and then I'll... Uh Thanks, Tessa. Um, so my group um, had Tatenda, Kate, and Pia and myself. Really, really interested. I think what we did was really just going through all of the different presentations and stating our reflection and um, sort of trying to make notes. So much was said. Um, and I think a good starting point would be where Kate really said, Sometimes it feels like we get stuck when we start asking the big question on what does youth, meaningful youth particip participation mean? That can be really overwhelming because there are different contexts and brackets to really place what that means. And we are giving an example where when we give examples of local participation happening in the village, it sounds really practical. But when you take it to big organizations like the UN, we get lost tokenism enters, adultism enters. So it's the question on what are we missing and what's really the link in this idea of meaningful youth participation that it's not being able to carry from local to international. And um, someone also made a really good point that was Tatenda on how conversations like this help us really change our imagination. So you can get really imaginative and allow participation flow without having that restricted and rigid technical way of what it should look like. I thought that was really interesting because that opens room for experimentation. And um, there was a really interesting point about, can we also um, allow participation where young people just observe you don't necessarily need them to speak all the time because that can be, you know, very coercive um, uh, sometimes. So it was really interesting where there's value with young people and children observe, observing policies and processes, seeing how things are done and getting inspiration for themselves. So a good example is with the Zimbabwe Youth Parliament. I thought that was really good. And then finally, um, there was also a point on what do young people really need? And there was that um, reiteration of space, 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 really important for us to create space because that is that innate desire of a young person and a child wanting space to um, have conversations and be listened to. Thank you so much. I could go on and on, but thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I know we're slightly over time, so I'm going to speak very fast and very briefly. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's really nice to meet some of you, um, often many of you for the first time. Um, please do stay in touch. We want the Living Archive to be an open working resource for the field. We see it as a kind of collective base camp for future work. Please join our network, contribute to the archive, get involved in the Grounded Dialogues, and if anyone would like to write blogs, please get in touch with me. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, see you all again soon, I hope. Thank you very much. And facilitators, amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really nice to meet you. <laughs>